I remember when, you know, I was looking up here today and I was thinking about 30 years when God started changing the worship. Well, it's like 50, help me. Back in 1970, 50 years ago, you know, when the charismatic movement and the Jesus people movement was taking place. No, we wouldn't let any of these people on the platform. T-shirt and church on the platform. Holes in your jeans, tennis shoes, tattoos, hair sticking up. Are you kidding me? Wearing some kind of a toboggan, stocking cap, whatever you call it, at the keyboard guy. Where is he? Who do you think you are coming to church dressed like that? Playing the drums and jumping up and down or you look like you're in a rock concert. <laughs> and they start getting saved and they start bringing this style and their music, their instruments and into, the ch- into the church. <laughs> and it's like, And a lot of people, a lot of people missed it. And I can take you to churches. They think they're churches, congregations. They're not churches. They've never legislated anything in their lives. That can take you to congregations and still are stuck in the 60s. Now, you need to decide now. We, you and I, we need to decide now that whatever he does, whatever it looks like, I'm going there with him. I'm going to get in on that. And it is true, and you've probably heard it, and I know some of you have heard it. It is true. It's a sad, horrible truth. That it's usually the group or groups that were formed through or in the last revival or great outpouring that persecutes, criticizes the new one the most. So I, what time is it? We, oh, we're good, aren't we? Time you usually end. <laughs> so I'll take just a few more minutes. This is how I feel like I'm to end this session. Well, God wants to, I'm kind of shifting gears just a little bit, but not totally. I think it was, is it, is it, did you say Dustin? Is that, is it worship? Is it Dustin. Dustin? Dustin? I think it was him last night that, that uh, started, uh, no, maybe it was the other guy up here leading worship this night, Doug, that started crying out or singing about wisdom and revelation. And, and it really resonated in me because that's, that's what I had been thinking about. I've had, I've had notes on that subject since Friday night that I haven't gotten to yet. But we're going to have to have this mix of wisdom and revelation. We're going to have to have today's fresh word, listening to what he's saying, Holy Spirit's saying now. And we're going to have to marry it to what he said yesterday. We don't leave what he did yesterday. There was a prophetic word over uh, somebody last night. Maybe, I think maybe you gave it. Could you? Yeah, to, to, to your dad. Your, uh, that you're not going to abandon what God 
taught you them. It's going to be, you're going to add to it what he's saying now. And that's the marriage of wisdom and revelation. And see, Jesus walked in that. He was so wise. I mean, he, he, understanding and depth. And yet he was always hearing and receiving downloads from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. Paul, you know, any, any good biblical leader walked in a mix of this. Wisdom, revelation. There's a word in the, in the Old Testament that is, it does what, I don't think we have an English word that does this. But there's a word in the Old Testament that combines the concept of wisdom and revelation in one word. Because wisdom, you know, that's that understanding from the past into now and it settles into you know, understanding. Revelation is what you receive now from Holy Spirit through the word or prophecy or he's speaking to you, a dream, a vision. Something is revealed to you is the root word. This Hebrew word combines both of those. A lot of people think that Solomon, when God came to him and said, ask me whatever, ask me one thing, I'll give it to you. And I was taught in Sunday school, he asked for wisdom and because he asked for wisdom, he got wealth and all the other stuff. But he really didn't ask for wisdom. The word is being, B-I-Y-N, or another form of bina in Hebrew. And it means understanding and discernment and revelation. God, what God really said to him is because you asked me for wisdom and revelation, you get all this other stuff. One phrase he asked God for, I think it's second, first Kings five, maybe one, one phrase was, he said, give me a hearing heart. That's an interesting phrase. Isn't it? That's the Hebrew phrase. He said, I want to, I want to have more than knowledge. I also want to hear from you. But hearing from you now is not enough either. I need wisdom. So this revival that comes, if we just get the now stuff, that'll also destroy the wine and skin because people will just make crazy mistakes and they won't have good doctrine and they'll do foolish things. And so there has to be a marriage of the two. And that's what Solomon had, and it's what Daniel had. It's the word used to describe Daniel, I think five times in the book of Daniel. So Daniel had more than wisdom. He had revelation. He could dream, interpret dreams. He, he's prophetic, but he also had wisdom. And these things set him apart above all the other counselors of the king. And God could use him to restore an entire nation because he had understanding. He, he understood the ways of God. He had wisdom, but he could also hear. This is the marriage of the apostolic and prophetic. You see, it's the apostolic wisdom and the prophetic revelation. And one, it's not that, it's not that uh, apostles usually aren't prophetic because most of them are, not all of them, but Sadly, because you need a marriage of the two. Yes. 